Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, happy Friday. I imagine that many of us are uh, have a lot of fatigue around Zoom and around meetings and uh, all the uh, all the new and uh, somewhat uh, challenging uh, circumstances we find ourselves in right now. But what a what an opportunity to be together today. So thank you for your time, and uh, let's just take a collective inhale and exhale so we can all just get in this space. So and let it go and just take a moment to look at these amazing faces. Uh, many of you who have not turned on your video, don't worry, you're, you're amazing and you're gorgeous. So turn them on if you can, um, but we're happy to have you any way we can get you. Welcome to the Design Jams. Um, my name is Michelle Morris. I'm the Associate Director of the Design Lab at UC San Diego. And I have a very, uh, I have the uh, privilege of working with a, a very, wonderful Design for San Diego team here. Uh, everybody wave your hands if you're on the, on the D4SD team. Yay. And uh, if you're specifically a facilitator from our community, we've got some design practitioners who are joining us. Wave your hands, please. Say hello, yay. And we've got some subject matter experts who are joining us that are experts in their field and they're gonna be helping us uh, think through some of the topics today. So if you're one of those, wave your hands so we can see you, yay. And you may have to scroll because we, we take up more than one screen. Uh, but thank you for everybody who is, uh, uh, who is here today. And then obviously you as the participants, this is really a chance for us all to come together. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to uh, just talk a little bit about the, uh, well, who we are as D4SD or Design for San Diego and what we're doing here today. So let me share that screen with everyone. All right. So, uh, just so I can get a get a quick uh, just get a quick uh, understanding of who was here last week. Just raise your hand if you were here last week. Yeah. Okay. And then and then others. Welcome. We're great. To, we're, it's great to have uh, more than uh, uh, more people here who are joining us. These design jams. Uh, they're part of what we call Design for San Diego, and that's really an opportunity. I'll show you the, our landing page. Uh, on our website, but it's really an opportunity for us to come together and both learn and utilize design thinking and human-centered design as a way to approach, uh, to think through, and actually start to tinker with some of the biggest problems that we face. Uh, design for San Diego 2020 was originally meant to be around uh, general sustainability, depending on how participants define that for our region. With uh, obviously the onset of COVID-19 and this global pandemic, uh, we have had a real opportunity uh, to think, think through how we can help San Diego address this specifically. Uh, I'm sure all of us know, uh, either know somebody or know of someone who has either contracted the virus, we know frontline medical workers and, um, and you know, a grocery store and FedEx workers and um, you know, all the folks that are still out there keeping our, our communities going. Uh, we know people who are, feel self-isolated or, or are struggling with self-isolation, uh, parents who maybe are pulling their hair out trying to homeschool, educators who are trying to figure out how to move things online, uh, and the list goes on and on. We are, all, we are all affected. So to have this chance to come together uh, and not just think through uh, general problems, but to think through uh, either those directly related to COVID-19 uh, or those that are, uh, that are a part of the, um, the broader umbrella of sustainability here in our region is, is a privilege and it's a gift and we're so happy to have you with us today. Uh, these design jams in particular uh, give us a lot of flexibility. Uh, they're meant to be a crash course uh, in many ways uh, in human-centered design. They are modularized, so they're four weeks, and we're dividing them up into different parts of the human-centered design, I'll say process, but it's not a linear process, but certainly the components of human-centered design. Uh, today's being uh, specifically around um, ideation and framing, uh, how do we get to ideation and the how, what do we do with that? And so we're gonna talk a little bit today, if you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, we're gonna go through some basics of what uh, design thinking is so that we can all get to the place where we can work collectively today. And we're gonna do that around uh, very curated exercises so that all levels of, of designers, because we really are all designers, uh, are able to participate and we get to learn from each other because each one of us is an expert in our own, in our own life and in our own experiences. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have a special focus on COVID-19 today. 
we also have uh, a very special message from council member Barbara Bree, who uh, is not only a friend of uh, obviously our region, since she's running for mayor, but certainly of UC San Diego and the kind of work that we do. So I'm gonna play that as a way to kick us off. Hi, my name is Barbara. Oop, let me give you a full screen there. I'm the council president pro tem of the San Diego City Council. I've been a longtime supporter and fan of the UC San Diego Design Lab. It's so important that we foster an outlet for members of the community to think critically about major societal issues and have a space not just to think about the problems, but to design solutions. Now more than ever, we need your help to evaluate solutions to the problems we are facing. COVID-19 is a universal enemy that has infiltrated virtually every aspect of life. So we must unite and work together to overcome the challenges it has spurred, whether that be related to our health, mobility, environment, or housing. Thank you for volunteering your time and minds to devising designs that will pave the path for a better San Diego. What you do over the next few weeks has the potential to impact San Diego for generations to come. Great. So that's a that's a that's a indicative of I think what we've been hearing at least as the D for SD team of a lot of the kinds of support that we're getting um, from not just our you know our own design community and those of you who are on this call, but from uh, from the politicians and those who are thinking about this uh, at a very strategic and systemic uh, systemic level. Uh, so let's talk about these design jams. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're in, we're in design jam two today. Last week we really talked about um, discovery. And if you look to the right of your screen, or of my screen, um, depending if it's mirrored, it might be on your left, you'll see a, a, what's called the double diamond. And what's important about human center design and how we think about it is, uh, and this will, we'll go into this a little bit later, is that we, we, we think through uh, not just problem solving, but also problem defining. And so a big part of what we do and the value of human center design is putting people first and understanding what drives them what makes them do what they do, whether it's buy something specific or need a certain function on a product or gravitate towards a certain service. What, what do people need? Because at the end of the day, that's what drives human behavior, that alongside the emotions that are attached to need. So last week, we really focused on the discovery piece. Uh, we're going to focus on ideation today. Uh, and then uh, just going through the timeline, just so you sort of see uh, the full context of, our, of these design jams, uh, there'll be a, a, some time uh, next week where if you've got an idea that you've been working on with the team already or that you start to work on today, you can request uh, online community feedback. And we'll go into that a little bit more later, but that's a real opportunity to figure out, hey, how, how's our team doing? Or how am I doing with how I'm thinking about my specific problem? And feedback is a huge part of human-centered design and a great way for us all to grow uh, as people and as professionals. Uh, then the following, our design, uh, the next Friday uh, will be Design Jam 3, where we go into some prototyping, where we we'll have some actual solutions we're playing with, and we'll talk about how to, um, to make some, some prototypes around those and how we test them. And then the last one, we'll talk a little bit about what do you do once you have that? How do you create some stories and make connections around how, what you're thinking about or what your team is thinking about and moving that forward? At the very, uh, at the very, or I guess the middle of May, we're going to have a summit where all the ideas that uh, are not only generated here in the design gems, but also through various teams that have been working in the design for San Diego space for several months, um, are going to have a chance to uh, submit to a challenge. So there'll be an opportunity to to go through a jury process, but also just to share what you have been doing with a broader audience. And that will take place again mid-May, and before that, we'll have some um, some submission paperwork. All of this information can be found on d4sd.org, so definitely check it out and know that these design jams can be done as one a one-off module uh, on a Friday uh, morning slash afternoon, or as part of a big uh, a big initiative and network here in in San Diego. And we certainly encourage you to join the larger the larger network. 
Quick couple, quick shout outs. I mentioned that some people have been doing D4SD challenges for some time now. And a big part of uh, that is our Educators Alliance. All over San Diego, we have uh, educators from the K through 12 space, uh, all the way through to four year universities, tech colleges, community, uh, community colleges, and co-curricular institutions that have joined together to think through how we do things like design jams. So a big shout out to them. A big shout out to our sponsors, um, who we can never do, we can't do anything without. And, uh, and then obviously a big shout out to you all today. So let's jump in quickly. Uh, as Stephen, uh, um, actually I don't think he mentioned it to the full group, but you may have heard when you were coming on, uh, all of what we're doing today is going to be done on the D4SD dashboard. So here is the URL. Uh, you should have it. If you don't, you should have received it in your pre- uh, your pre-jam email. If you don't have it, it looks like this. And everything on here will tell you where you, you know, uh, where you need to go. So that's going to be how we're working. Uh, not only you as participants, but we as the design a team that is, is hosting this jam will be working off of that same dashboard. And here's a quick, if you look at the screen, you'll see a little bit of how we're doing our timeline for the day. I'm already a few minutes over, so I'm going to move forward quickly, but we will jump into a, a recap of last week. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time, we're going to go over some specific COVID-19 uh, topics. We're going to break into some awesome breakout rooms that will have our subject matter experts and some design facilitators, both from the D4SD team as well as from our community. We'll all come back and hang out a little bit to reflect, and then there'll be plenty of flexible time later to continue working as a team. Uh, what am I missing from the D4SD team? Have I covered everything? If not, please chime in now. If not, I'm going to move it over to the amazing Jennifer Taylor to yes. take us through design right. thinking. Okay. So, Thank you, Jennifer. Absolutely. All right. You are to, you, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Please stop sharing yours and then I will take on over. Let's see. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna do a quick recap on what we mean by design thinking and a little bit of where we are at um, within this process. Again, as Michelle said, it's really a nonlinear kind of process where you're moving between defining a problem space, exploring solutions, redefining that problem space, um, and uh, we'll focus on what we've got for today with the ideation. Um, but to start, what do we mean by design thinking? What do we mean by design? The, the word has a lot of different meanings. One of the ways that I like to think about design is in the ways that each person interacts with their environment to address specific goals. So we're always engaging in different activities with different needs, and sometimes we hit different pain points. So we have different gains, different opportunities that we can take advantage of. And this is a picture of me on campus some months ago. Um, and we have these really nifty uh, trash bins that have foot pedals. And what I like about these is as a user, I have a goal of being able to dispose of trash, but sometimes I might be a little bit hesitant about the sanitation issues around like, are these going to be really dirty? Do I have a place to wash my hands? And so here's one sort of solution that addresses that need that I have to dispose of trash while keeping a very sanitary situation. Um, and really kind of brings to light because it's a little bit surprising. Like, oh, this is so nifty to have this kind of situation. But design manifests in a lot of different ways. And above all, as you're thinking about design, we want to remind you that you are a designer. You just might not know it yet. What do we mean by that? Uh, Eric brought this up last time. One of the classic ways that we think about design is with this notion of a desire path. And what this means is sometimes there are formal ways that the built environment creates paved paths for us to get from point A to point B. And sometimes those designs serve us really well, but at other times we have to interact and design our built environment in other kinds of ways. And the dirt path here is a representation of that. There are lots of workarounds that ultimately become useful solutions and they give us a lot of um, understanding of what people need. So how do we go about design? As Michelle mentioned, uh, the double diamond is a really useful way for us to think about the process for a few reasons. First off, the diagram shows how we're going wide, we're diverging, we're exploring a lot of options. 
and then to converge. So we're trying to find points of focus. And we do that as we move from a loosely defined problem space to exploring that, going wide, talking with a lot of stakeholders, gathering different primary and secondary research sources, and then we converge. We get a point of focus, which we define in terms of a particular point of view and a problem statement. Then we start to explore again, think about uh, various possibilities for solutions, how we can prototype and test them, and eventually we arrive at a particular one that we want to develop further, that we want to implement, potentially connecting with others who can help us to put that into, into works. Um, in order to make this concrete, I'd like to give an example from one of the classes that um, I co-teach with another one of our organizers on here, Eric. Um, we teach a class on design thinking in public health, and we worked with a lot of stellar students to address some of the challenges uh, that other UCSD students face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as one of those examples, we do a lot around basic needs. Uh, last year, we had some students who were exploring uh, challenges related to food insecurity. And so our students worked through this process, starting first with a very loosely defined problem space of how can we address challenges around food insecurity? How can we create a more robust system to help students address this basic need of having a consistent uh, quantity and good quality food sources? And they started off very similar to what you might have done if you joined us for the jam last week, discovery. As an early part of discovery, they made a game plan. They thought about who am I gonna talk to? What are the different kinds of reports and secondary data that I'm also gonna look at so I can go wide in understanding a problem space, getting at the trends, understanding things like what's the prevalence of food insecurity, who tends to be most affected, what kinds of solutions already exist. And they also went deep in talking with different stakeholders to understand how is this currently being addressed? What are the pain points for our food pantries? What are the pain points for people who are addressing food recovery? And so in a similar fashion, last week when we had our discovery session, you started to ideate on different stakeholders who you wanted to talk with and think about the different assumptions that you might have about what's happening in your problem space. And perhaps over the past week, you diverged a little bit further to explore what does this problem space look like? What are the various possibilities? And maybe you even began to converge. You started to identify, hmm, there's some key pieces of information I've gathered here from talking with different stakeholders, some high level themes and some key insights that stand out for me. In the case of our students, their conversations with folks who are working in the food pantries and folks who are supporting food recovery led them to see, gosh, there's a lot of bottlenecks between an ample supply of uh, perishable foods that are able to be donated through this food recovery uh, network that we have available on the campus and actually being able to get those delivered through the food pantries that are there because there's not always enough volunteers to coordinate with the deliveries. There's not always enough storage space. So they started to identify some key pieces, which then for them helped them to define a particular problem definition. So they thought about a point of view. They started to formulate a how might we statement. That's gonna be a lot of our focus for today as part of ideation. We want you to get down to a focused problem statement. So from there, you can start to ideate on what might be the different solutions that would help us to address this. In the case of our students, they started to ask what might be the ways that we can address issues around food storage on campus? Are there different places that are untapped resources that could enable food recovery efforts to be a little bit more resilient, to be able to operate at a greater capacity, given that there's the demand, there's the supply, there's just this bottleneck in the middle. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about where they ended up in that in a little bit. So much of this and what we're doing today is about creating and checking and redefining. Eric brought this up last time, but the idea here is you're defining a problem space, you're checking your assumptions about what you think is happening in that problem space, you're creating, you're ideating as ways to better understand that problem space, you're defining your problem today. As you explore solutions, you might redefine that problem again tomorrow, next week, um, and that's part of the process too, because it is nonlinear. Last of all, I wanna hit on some aspects of a design mindset. It's so much more than the tools that you use or walking through this process. What is your way of thinking about design as you engage with different stakeholders, different end users? We brought this up last time. We really like to think about the change mindset. Last week in Jam 1, we talked a little bit about the value of being curious and being humble and how you explore a problem space. This time I wanna hit on the next three real briefly. 
When we think about being agentic, we're thinking about how can I help empower myself and others in my community to take action? How can I honor actions already taken? Where do I have wiggle room to take action? How might that shape the kinds of solutions and even the way that I frame my problem in the first place? Networked, how might I contribute to building a more resilient system in order to connect the various community members who play a role? Sometimes we're trying to remove bottlenecks, we're trying to find more fluid ways that the different community members can engage in this process and contribute. And generative, this is a classic one. Questions like, how might we get at this generative nature? Sometimes we go for quantity over quality. That's gonna be important for ideation. Create a lot of different options. You'll have time later to start to filter down and figure out the priorities. Um, I wanna end with just a quick example of what I mean for at least one of these. Um, agentic is, I think, a little bit abstract. So to go back to that story I shared earlier about the students addressing food insecurity, when they got into ideating on solutions, they recognized that there were some underutilized spaces even within their graduate student spacing on campus. And so they started to think about, well, maybe there are ways we could shift the use of that because food recovery and uh, these uh, different food distribution services are really relevant to our student population. And we think this would be a benefit. But they paused and they said, but I don't know that we can really change that. And we should figure out you know, who is in a senior administrative role that maybe has the permissions to be able to override what's happening now and make a difference. We gotta figure out who's in charge here. And they took a little bit of time and then they reframed. They redefined that problem and thought, well, actually we are graduate students and we engage with the Graduate Student Association. We actually have a lot of agency in recommending what is done with that space. Their prototypes ultimately ended up being about proposals to their graduate student association in order to develop different ways that they, they might be able to repurpose space. And ultimately, they were able to free up spaces and enable a little bit more coverage of some of our uh, resources on campus to address food insecurity. And what's really interesting is they later presented those solutions to some senior administration <laughs> who responded with relief and the senior administration said, gosh, I really didn't have the agency to act here because in a position of power, it looks really weird if I come in and tell graduate students what to do with their space that they control. So sometimes you don't know that you have the agency that you have to act. Keep in mind, what are the ways that you and other community members have more wiggle room and that will help in serving how you even frame your problem and your solution. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Steve to talk a little bit about the design jam tracks. And Steve, I'll uh, stop sharing. All right, over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Jennifer. All right, can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so today we've got a bit of an update about the different problem reports that um, we want to share. So there's a few different design jam tracks. And if you go to the dashboard, so here's the link to the dashboard today. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of different tracks, a couple of different topic areas that we have. So I'll give you maybe just a few seconds to get over there. All right. So the first one that we're presenting on is around public transportation. So this is one of the same ones that we had last week. And the motivation for this one is uh, that public transportation is a necessity. It's one of the only ways that people can get to grocery stores and pharmacies and a lot of other amenities that they still need, even when quarantined. At the same time, sitting on a crowded bus is a pretty big vector for spreading disease. So we want to think about how can we continue to utilize these services in a way that's safe for everyone. For the next problem area, we have supporting communities and activating volunteers. And so this is based on the idea that there are a lot of really interesting community initiatives that are going on right now. Uh, some of those include sewing masks for hospitals or 3D printing ventilators. And uh, what we want to do with this one is think about how can we continue to cultivate and foster these kinds of community networks and really activate the people who are already uh, engaging in these great initiatives. When we think about 
health equity, uh, we want to try to provide for everyone's indiv individual and unique needs. And so a lot of students who rely on food vouchers when they're at school don't have access to those types of programs. Um, other people who are in transient housing situations may rely on public services like food pantries and libraries who may also not have um, access to those services. And so for this problem, uh, we're really interested in how do we provide for these unique needs that people have. The next problem, and this is a new one, um, a new take on, on, one, on one of the problems from last week, is around re-entry. So this is based on the uh, announcement from Governor Newsom this week uh, that he's considering six steps in order to re-enter, uh, to help people re-enter society after quarantine. And so as an example, one of these is around contact tracing. So the process of contact tracing is how do we sleuth out um, the people that have tested positive and have interacted with different people? How do we identify the people that they've interacted with and monitor those people to make sure um, you know, that they're healthy and that they don't need to go back into self-quarantine? For the next problem, it's around non-healthcare essential workers. So this is something that came up last week. There are a lot of workers that are on the front lines that are doing a lot of important work. And so this is janitorial work, this is working at grocery stores, this is cashiers, this is food preparation services, this is delivery drivers. And they have a lack of personal protective equipment. They also lack access to health uh, benefits. And so for this problem, we wanna think about how can we support these workers uh, while they're doing their essential work. The next problem is around supporting families. And there are a lot of problems related to this one. So thinking about uh, a lot of families are quarantined in small spaces where they're sharing resources, but they wanna limit personal contact or physical contact, maybe if one of, the, um, if one of them is sick. So we wanna think, the other, the other challenge there too is around personal space. So we wanna make sure that people have room to uh, essentially decompress and, and have um, space for themselves. Uh, so how can we think about providing for those in very small houses while also understanding that families have unique challenges like um, uh, working from home and providing childcare to their children. Finally, around uh, cultivating and sharing compassion. So for this one, there's a lot of things that are going on right now and it can be really hard for people to know what to focus on. So there's information overload. There's also pressures from work and other places to continue to be productive. And so how do we start to, uh, how do we start to develop a space where we can um, develop a culture of compassion uh, through things like um, compassion banks and virtual support networks? And with that, I think I'm gonna pass it over to Brian. Yeah, thank you. Can I go ahead and share my screen? <laughs> So today we're going to be doing the type of ideation that Jennifer described around the topics that Steve just walked us through using an online co collaboration system called Mural. Uh, if you're less familiar with Mural, uh, a member of our team, Ben Gibbs, put together this nice video that has a couple of tips on how to get started with Mural uh, that we'll watch now. And as part of the, uh, as you go into the breakout sessions, the facilitators will help introduce you to more features. Uh, let's see if we can, there, we're playing now. Brian, is your volume turned on your computer? Brian, we can't hear it. I think you might need to play it out loud through your speakers oh, right. for us to hear it. Uh, uh, and so on. So uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go in. Hi everyone, in this quick video, I'll share with you the following in mural. Navigate using outlines, creating sticky notes, and zooming in and out. We'll go in and start with outlines. So outlines are a quick way to maneuver around the page. To access your outlines, you're gonna to wanna to 
click this icon up in the upper right. By clicking it, the sidebar will show up. All of these options are quick links to different parts of the page. So by hitting gather and formulate, it'll bring you over to the uh, gather and formulate section. By hitting bring your problem, it'll bring you to the problem section uh, and so on. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and close out the outline bar. And we're going to do a little zooming in and zooming out. So if you're using a laptop and you have a trackpad, you can use your fingers to zoom in and zoom out. And then using your two fingers, you can scroll. If you're using a mouse, you can use this bottom right map, uh, map function. Uh, you can use this to zoom in or zoom out. And then by clicking in the little mini map, Again, to the bottom right, you can maneuver around the site with ease. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move up to the sandbox, and I'll show you how to create post-it notes. So the quickest and easiest way to create a post-it note is just double-clicking in an open space. So we're going to double-click, and we got a post-it note. Mm -hmm. If you click outside of the post-it note, it'll make the post-it note inactive. If you click it once, it will make it active and you can edit it. If you double click it while active, you can write it. You can also change the size by using this bottom circle, which you can enlarge or make smaller. To change the color of your post-it note, all you have to do is click the post-it note one time, go over to color, and we'll change it to yellow. You can also give it a border, make font smaller or larger, and then change the font type. So that pretty much concludes the quick tutorial to use Mural. If you have any other questions, please ask your uh, your facilitator. He will be moderating the, re moderating the rest of your activity. Thank you for watching. Bye. Terrific. Now we're going to uh, move into our breakout uh, topic rooms. So to do that, uh, go into the tiny URL that we've got linked here below in the, in the slides, uh, identify the topic that you want to dig into, and there are going to be two links associated with each topic. One link is to the Zoom, the, uh, Zoom call itself, so join that, and then the link right next to it is to a mural board that was created specifically for your topic. So with that, I hope you enjoy your, uh, your uh, breakout sessions. All right. See you all in the other rooms. Just as a note, um, to get over into those breakout rooms, you do have to leave this call to go join one of the other ones. Um, but throughout the entire time, I will be here or somebody will be in the plenary room. If you get lost or if you have any questions, feel free to come back into the main link that was sent to you last night. Um, so head on over to whatever you're interested in and we'll, we'll get started with the ideation. Yep, and if there's anyone who wants to know more about design thinking in general or doesn't see a topic area that interests them, hang out here in the plenary room. I'll be here with. So welcome back. I imagine there's still a few folks that may be joining us, um, but uh, most of you are here. Uh, let me, let's do, just a big exhale one more time now that we're all back together. Uh, and I want to say that uh, we all know having participated in, in workshops, there's never a good time to take a break. Right, you're it's always like right in the middle of something, or you know, actually, I did hear from at least one of the groups that this ended up being as breaks go a good time. But if it wasn't a good time in your room, if you were on a on a roll, just know that uh, we're just taking this time because it's important for us to come back together as a community. Remember what the spirit of D4SD is. Maybe learn a couple things from each other. Um, we'll add a little bio break in there, and uh, also just remember that uh, we have flexible time. So the way that the design jams are built gives us at least you know another hour to spend some time going back to our rooms and jumping into uh, into the problem space or continuing down the process wherever you are so that said um, those of you at least who, uh, who do have your video on we'll do what we did last week just a quick thumb check um, how are things going not sure um, really confused where are we at 
So lots of thumbs ups. Okay, we got a sideways. Okay, got a couple sideways. All right. Okay, oh, we got, oh, Kevin has a, has a double in there. Oh, we got a few reactions in there. Great, okay. So um, what I'm gonna ask you to do quickly is um, if you have uh, one word uh, or a phrase in your mind of how you're feeling right now, I want everybody to open the chat and make sure at the bottom it says everyone. So click the blue link and make sure you scroll to the very top and it says everyone. And just write down like the phrase or the word uh, that sort of encapsulates what you just experienced. It could be anything. And nobody's gonna be paying attention to who puts what in there. We're just gonna get a sense of the group. And yes, you need to do this, right? Come on, we, we, have to be, we all have to show up here 100%. So just take it for a moment and, and uh, take a second to think about it and jump in. Okay. Some really positive ones. Okay, progress, great, clue. <laughs> okay. At least we're not seeing my facilitator's a loser. I mean, there have been a few private comments. I don't wanna, no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Um, hard to navigate on the laptop, great. Super yeah. fragile. Right, whoever put super califragilistic uh, or tried to put that in there, that was Ben Gibbs. I love it. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen for a second, guys. That just gives kind of a sense of where we are as a, as a, uh, as a group. We will have plenty of opportunity to, to do uh, more in-depth feedback. Um, but let me just first welcome you back here again and do a thumb check. Um, I want to talk about the technology a little bit. So, uh, first of all, the compassion, the gracious, uh, the gracious attitudes that everyone has had as we sort of have, have navigated uh, through using some of the new utensils or uh, uh, so utensils. Uh, some of the, the platform today we used is Mural, and so thank you for everyone's openness and recognizing. I think Kevin Popovich, you put it uh, great earlier. This this is a time for us all to have patience, right? And for us all to be not just forgiving with each other, but just really generous. And this group has done that. So thank you. And thank you to the D4SD support team that just jumped in at every moment to make sure things were running well. So those things aside, how was Mural? We'll do a little thumb check again. How was using Mural as a way to think through uh, framing and ideating and, and moving into a place where we have a, a clear uh, a clear point of view. Yes, thumbs up, thumbs sideways. I'm gonna focus mostly on the participants on this one. Can you guys keep it held up so I can see? Okay, sideways, okay. All right, so this is good for us. What I would ask for you as we move forward, and I'm going a little bit out of order on, uh, on slides, but most people who know me know I, I'm not a big slide follower. Uh, give us that feedback. We wanna make sure that we, there's no, perfect tools out there, but we certainly want to iterate in not only the spirit of human-centered design, but we wanna make these sessions as productive and as fun as possible. So please make sure you give us uh, more detailed feedback when we get to that place. Um, and then uh, just, just generally the idea of moving from an idea to framing that idea, maybe pulling in some discovery or some data, some interviews that we uh, that people may have brought from the last design uh, jam session, number one, or maybe from the subject matter experts or facilitators in their room. Moving into framing and then into ideating, how did the activities go or the flow of how we approach here in design thinking? We'll just again do the general thumbs up, thumb sideways, thumbs down in terms of understanding, fun, okay? Great, and I'm gonna rely on the team. I have to scroll down as you may or may not be able to see on my screen. Um, but the, 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 the best part of human-centered design and also some of the tricky part is that it's not a linear process, right? But we do put these frameworks uh, around how we're thinking about the information that we're receiving and how we're, and the, uh, and the, the challenges that we want to address uh, so that we can keep moving forward. So again, we ask you to give us some feedback as we move forward. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you all, and this could be the facilitators. Um, I'll just have you, uh, you know, raise your hand um, and uh, if you want to speak or somebody from your room. I'd love to hear what happened in the rooms, if there were any specific what we call aha moments in human-centered design, meaning, oh, I hadn't thought about that, or wow, this took a totally different turn than we originally thought. Or, you know what, we really struggled with this. I wonder if that would be food for thought for somebody else. So you can either raise your hand or use the chat. Um, and I'm gonna try and get the gallery up here so I can actually see you all. 
And I don't know this about Zoom, but as you're sharing my screen, can you see that I'm pulling you guys out as well? Or do you just see my slides? You just just see your slides. slides. Okay, great. That's good for me to know. Okay, does anybody want to go first? Because I will absolutely volunteer you um, if, if there are no... Yeah. Oh, wait, Kevin, you want to talk about your room? <laughs> yeah, my room was awesome. So, you know, one of the things... So, uh, uh, I, I always appreciate the uh, logistical... Uh, set up that you have in place already. And I saw the same thing inside a mural. Um, I thought it was very uh, well designed as an intake to help people do learn the basics. And it was very easy to get everybody engaged in the, uh, the process of the design that we had. And I thought that the design flow worked well. Um, uh, every, it, it appeared everybody was able to contribute. Um, the, uh, and uh, I wish we could have had more time because I did like that we set some things up, like we executed some things as individual exercises, and then we did some things as collaborative exercises through some of those different steps. Because I wanted to make sure that we got that sense of collaboration and interactivity. I didn't want any one person to take a burden on the who that they identified early. Um, uh, so um, the structure always working. I think if I was, if time was not an issue, I probably would have included twice as much time because I thought that I think that I could, you know, our group could have had that same level of interactivity throughout the entire flow. Um, I was feeling a little pressure to make sure we got done on time, um, but probably at least another 15 or 20 minutes would have uh, given me the sense that we all had enough time to talk about each other's and get the most out of that collaboration. Uh, but all in all, two thumbs up. I thought it was a great exercise and uh, and thank you to my group for their patience and their contribution. Yay. Uh, any uh, other groups that want, I want to talk a little bit about how things happen in their room or any aha moments, things that, uh, that they, that they want to share with the group that might help us all learn a little bit. I'm going to ask Sage, you always have lots to say and I love it. So, would you mind? I'm just going to pick one then. Um, yeah. So I really enjoyed the anonymous voting feature of Mural. Um, a lot of times things like uh, relationships, power, space come into how people make decisions. So you can have, uh, you can have six ideas and, and then when you ask people to vote, if that vote is public, then all of these other social and cultural dynamics are going to influence the vote, right? Um, whereas when you have anonymous voting, um, it kind of, it writes a blank check, which is really great. Um, so that you don't know who's voting for what. And so really when you have anonymous voting, truly the idea with the most energy behind it comes forward. And I was explaining to my group, I'm like, maybe it's not the best idea. Maybe it's not the worst idea because best and worst are a subjective judgment. Right. But when people vote, then you find out which idea has the most energy behind it, like who, how you have the most number of people that think that's an idea that we can move forward on. And that's a really great way of, of kind of putting your thumb on the pulse of, of which idea is going to have the most success moving forward. And in our group, it actually really surprised me the result of which how might we question um, we ended up choosing because we came out of last week with three really, really well-defined users and problem statements and a, and a really clearly unpacked context. We use those as the input for this week, but then obviously in the beginning, we opened it up and said, if anybody else has a new story they'd like to share and for us to consider, please bring it in. And the one that won the voting actually was the newest idea. Um, and, and that's neat. That's a really interesting outcome. Um, from the use of the anonymous voting tool. So now we have something to move forward with um, that got about, I think it was eight out of 10 votes, right? So 80% of the group decided this is the one to move forward with. So that's- I love what you're saying, Sage. And this is a really a strong takeaway for, uh, just going back to what you're saying. Um, you know, you know, people, the, that voting feature or any kind of uh, uh, sort of forcing function where people are able to really say what's on their mind uh, it doesn't always reflect all of the discussion and that's for lots of all the reasons that you that you mentioned and so um it is really that is a not only an aha moment where you realize oh okay maybe this is what people were thinking um but also it tells you that there's an opportunity as a team 
uh, that you know whether you've got some more dominant voices or you know, and some less dominant voices, or if, if if the last minute you've you've had no you know nothing really to contribute, but then you want to say one thing that can change the entire dynamic mm -hmm. of what's been said, and so every voice truly counts. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the beauty, uh, beautiful pieces and the magical pieces of, of this human-centered design approach. Uh, people first, people always, right? So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Sage. I appreciate that. A quick uh, question. Can I ask a quick question on that, Sage? So do you think that context uh, is lost in that, uh, in that voting no? You know what I mean? Like, because there's one thing, right? Say you got 100 people in the room. And for some reason, you know, 60% 60 60 of the people or 60 votes are something, right? But does, do we lose something in anonymity by, by disregarding or not acknowledging context for the vote? Um, I'm going to say yes, but I'm okay with that loss mm -hmm. because I always want to give everybody an opportunity to speak. And, and sometimes, as Michelle pointed out, they might have a soft voice naturally, or maybe they're just, they like to observe and think deeply and then act in one step. And the, the anonymous voting makes that possible. You know, I, I used to be teaching in design education in Hong Kong and in Asian cultural context, anonymous voting is absolutely critical mm -hmm. um, because, you, because of issues like shame. Um, people don't want to put forth what might be perceived as a bad idea or could cause a problem for other people. And, and we have that dynamic in every society. So you still need to give those people the opportunity to express themselves. Agree, agree. And that's what I love about it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and, and I don't wanna get us off that topic, but I can see reasons why that um, if you lost the context, you may lose the meeting. We'll save right. that. For, we'll save that for a beer or a other <laughs> other so here, so, beverage at some point. <laughs> so this is definitely a great topic. But what here? Here's what what I'll say that that can kind of bring us back to this. I think uh, a couple of things, right? Whether it's in a voting context or sometimes early on when you're brainstorming, it's a silent brainstorm before you start talking. Where people write, so everybody's voices heard at least some of their initial thoughts, whatever it is, there is a place for, for anonymity so that people feel really safe because you never know what, what, what goes into why people do what they do. Kevin, to what you're saying is that, I mean, I think the most powerful thing that we have as human centered designers, whether you identify yourself that way or not, is the question, right? And so it, it's not that it's not that once you vote like this is it, you may find that actually so much context has been lost as you move forward in the process that you get stuck. And, you know, what we say when you get stuck is you have to go back to the problem mm -hmm. because you haven't done something. You haven't gone deep enough to understand in order to move forward. And so what I would say to what Kevin is saying is that it's OK during the process to lose things here and there. It's like the market, right? It goes up, it goes down. But over the long term, right, there's hopefully a positive trend. I don't know if that's something to say right now, but uh, but my point is, is that uh, know that if you lose a little bit here and there, you'll find out soon enough as long as you're true to uh, to the communication and the human centered design uh, process. And so that if you do get stuck, you just go back and figure out what context was lost. And if anybody has questions on that type of stuff, we can, we can have a long discussion. As you can see, there's lots of expertise on this call and in our community. So happy to, to revisit this at a later time. Thank you both. Uh, really fast, going back to the groups, anything in Jennifer's group or uh, anything that happened in any of the other groups? Melissa, your group, that Brian, Stephen, anything that you uh, want to share in terms of uh, observations you made or ahas that happened in that group? I can share a real quick one. I want to thank those in our room talking about volunteers, how we mobilize community members, a lot of different ways of framing problems. And something that I think is interesting to point out is we had a few people who were returning from last week's session and were a little bit more grounded in the context had done a little bit of research, more of the discovery process. And we had others that were new to the topic and were learning a little bit from the expertise that they already bring in the room from their immediate lived experience. And that was valuable. And I think we saw how both of those pieces are really important. There are instances where we heard people explain the specific experiences they had, like Oh, I've seen teenagers on TikTok. They're creating these amazing videos. I wonder if there's a way we can harness their capabilities with media. I know at least some teenagers in my life are a little bit bored or have some free time. Can we harness that to support navigating technologies for others less savvy? So really interesting lived experience. And yet others brought in, hey, 
talking with specific stakeholders. We were lucky to have a subject matter expert in our room to talk a little bit about specific volunteer aspects. Um, so shout out in particular um, to uh, Kelly working with us, Stacy Kelly. Um, and I, I just want to say, I think we saw both like opportunities and pain points and hmm, we're getting there, we're getting sharper. We can definitely see how going back, doing more discovery while we also keep going with ideation on solutions, those are both going to be really useful as we sharpen on a problem space. It's been really fun to iterate even on how we formulate these problem statements and how might we question to get started. I love that. Thank you, Jennifer. And also I'm putting in the chat since you mentioned Stacy's name. Stacy Kelly is spearheading uh, San Diego's very first design week coming up in September. So uh, we will have lots of information being put out through various channels on that front. Um, and thank you for that. Is there anyone else before we move on? I know we do have to be cognizant of time and I know that the people are chomping at the bits to get back in their room. Um, okay. I did well, want to just... Uh, yes, please. Michelle, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but one of the things I, I'd like to point out with the dynamics of the group is that the facilitators um, sh maybe should not be the leaders of the initiatives that come out of this. Um, it is very difficult to be both a facilitator who is supposed to have no, um, no influence on the outcome and also be a champion of an idea because it biases your ability to facilitate. So for everybody that's in all the groups, um, you know, we're starting to move into solution space and, and ask yourself, I think, two questions. One is, you know, do I want to be part of whatever we're developing as a solution? And what role do I want to play in that? Because at some point, a leader is going to need to emerge um, in each group space that says, I'm going to be the one that actually does something with this. Um, and that is what transforms it from being an exercise, which if that's what you're here for, great, you know, use it as a learning tool. But if you are actually engaged and you want to be part of the solution and it's in its implementation um i just want to see that now so that over the next few weeks that leader emerges in each group i think this is this is a critical a critical point that you're bringing up uh sage and this is for everyone so the beauty of this is you of the design jams and and exercises or initiatives like this is that it can be an exercise you know part of what we want to do is share how do you you know how do you do design thinking um because there's lots of different ways to, to approach it um and then how do you apply that right to the real world um and if you are not if if the what happened in your room is not something that you're passionate about um, but there is, there are other things that you're passionate about. We have this broader design for San Diego umbrella through which we hope that you will come and play, play with us and take that idea and we can work with you to find a team that might be interested in, in your idea. Um, but it will take, it's not the D4SD team to, to Brian's point. It's not uh, the facilitators. Uh, that's, we're here to support you for sure. Um, but there really does have to be either a lead and, and all the, the team members also have to be committed to wanting to see where this goes. And hopefully this process and this team will be there to help you get there. So thank you for that. If you have any questions about what that looks like or you're not sure whether or not this is just an exercise for, for you or something that you really do want to see move forward, well, then um, one way for uh, one way uh, for you to uh, to, to find out is to uh, to keep in touch with us, right? So we have uh, the link on the dashboard that we've been using throughout this design jam and we'll continue to use through all the design jams. Uh, you will see at the very top uh, a link to the Slack channel. So please join um, because there are more people than are showing up uh, for these live jams. They are recorded and they are being shared to other populations. So it's a fantastic way to stay connected and see who else is excited about your, your idea um and your your problem space or your potential solution and or and, and that or that of your teams uh, also we have our email here you're welcome to reach out to us and uh, if there's a, i imagine that each of the facilitators or some of you have offered uh your information we can certainly put you in contact with folks as needed we're all one big community um also what is kind of fun is if you're not quite sure uh, where are you, again, where you fall? Is this just something I want to play with for a little while on my Fridays or do I want to move it forward? We have an opportunity to get some feedback from a broad spectrum of subject matter experts and uh, stakeholders in the community, as well as, uh, as other, uh, other folks that are working with us at the D4SD 
uh, in the D4SD community. So if you look at the right here, this, uh, this URL, check it out. Uh, it will take you to the D4SD page and it will tell you exactly how you might submit for what's called early feedback. It will not be public. Um, it is really a, it's really a safe and fun way to get uh, some, some initial feedback on your idea, on your approach, on who else you might talk to, et cetera. If you have any other questions about that, again, find us. Hold on, I'm not seeing what's in the chat, but I'm going to. Uh, do we know what experts will be there? Uh, we have a whole a whole community depending on the, the topic. So uh, we can certainly get with you offline if you're specifically interested and in who might uh, be available for your topic. I don't have that with me at the moment, but our team does. Um, do we have group chats for each team? That is something that will be up to your to your group, right? So I would say, uh, depending on your room or maybe the team within your room, that's something for you all to organize. Um, and if you need some help doing that, we're here to, to help you on the tech front or just the approach front. Um, Oh, there's one other thing. So also we are, there's a, uh, there's a URL, URL here. Um, and I'm going to ask some of the team to put these URLs in the chat, please, since I don't have that ability to, I prefer not to do that right now while I'm speaking. So thank you for putting both of this community feedback opportunity link, as well as this uh, design jam feedback. We'd love to get some of your detailed feedback on uh, how things went with Mural. There was a lot of stuff going through the chats around you liked Mural, you liked more the templates than the Mural itself. We had some uh, some sideways thumbs earlier around the technology. And so we want to iterate upon that for the next design jam and also make sure that if you have any questions leaving here that you know you will get some answers as as you move forward. Uh, and that brings us sorry, to our flexible time. Um, we are, as I mentioned, we have tons of, uh, of folks that are ready to jump back into your topic rooms. Uh, you're welcome to stay here in the plenary session. Stephen Dow and I will be in this uh, main room. Stephen was going to talk about uh, storyboarding as a tool to start to get your head around uh, the, the, where you are in your problem space or your potential solution. And so if that sounds interesting to you, uh, you're welcome to stay here or again, go back into your, uh, into your other rooms. If you have to leave us, please uh, definitely stay in touch and uh, know that we have another design jam here next Friday. I'm gonna turn it over to the, the rest of the D4SD team. What am I missing? Any other thoughts before we move forward? One more quick thing to add. If you're looking at the dashboard and you've been working in your room, Keep in mind, those links will continue to be available. If you wanna do a gallery walk and see how other groups have been working through this same ideation process, you are very welcome to do that. Um, that's what they're there for. Yep. And then I, I did actually uh, open up the, uh, sorry, D4SD uh, on our website, d4sd.org. You'll find the, the community feedback, that early opportunity, as well as the quick, uh, the quick, uh, evaluation or feedback uh, form that I think Stephen has put into the chat. So thank you for that. Uh, any other thoughts for the group before we before we go go back out? All right. Well, thank you for, for uh, um, on behalf of uh, the D4SD team. And uh, we look forward to hanging out with you for another uh, an hour, a little less than an hour, and um, maybe seeing you next week as well. Can I just add a quick thought? Please do, Stephen Dow. Hi, um, you guys are heading back to your rooms. I think one thing you can think about as a goal, one goal to maybe try to do for today is grab onto an idea that you like and think about how you can articulate it more clearly so you can communicate it to other people, maybe find a team, maybe get feedback, take advantage of that community feedback opportunity. So as a goal for today, find an idea that you like and maybe find a couple of other people that wanna work on it with you. And if you're gonna stick around and learn how to storyboard, we're just gonna do it right here in this room. That's it. All right, thank you team, thank you participants. Uh, be safe and healthy out there. Cool. And the facilitators, I'll have you, I'll, I'll see you. Um, Thanks, Michelle.